Hello. Woo. Wow. Hello. Does anybody hear me? Yes. No. Okay. Have street cleaning going on today, so uh, I'm going to be fighting uh, noises outside. So I apologize for that. Uh, let me start sharing the screen. Sharing the screen. Oh. All right. How is everybody this morning? resort to adjustments because this is too to Okay, so I hope everybody is awake. My tea is here and I sure need it today. So let me get started. So first a comment on um, the exam. Exam will be graded by tonight. Uh, I'm pretty much done. I have a little left and then I have to, I was collecting all of the results into a spreadsheet. So then I have to uh, transfer it to Canvas. Um, so by tonight you will know the results and I will also post the solutions and then we can comment on them. Uh, I'm always trying to stay within eight days of the exam and it seems that I'm gonna be, <laughs> since the exam was in the evening, I'm gonna be on time. However, last moment. Uh, let me share my slides. Do you see my camera, my video? No. There we go. All right. It's that one of that little hardware camera that got moved again. Okay, so now you see me, you see my slides. Let's get going. So let me first uh, briefly review what we've been working on. Um, so I'm going to go over notation again. Um, we have del dealt with mass transport. And a lot of the conceptual uh, way of how we assemble equations should be very familiar by now, but notation differs slightly. So now we are instead of just density of a phase, entire phase A, uh, the entire phase, we are looking into chemical species within that phase. And if I label whatever it is that I'm interested in tracking as A, then rho A is mass just of that chemical species A divided by volume, so that's mass concentration. And everything else we typically label B with the understanding that I always really have more than two chemical species, but I'm looking at one and then the background, if you will, is B. So most commonly we're modeling binary mixtures. Again, sometimes it's important to track multiple species within, and then we are actually going to go and label them, possibly number them one, two, three, four, up to n, or however many I'm tracking. Now, the more you have, of course, the more difficult it is to solve the problem. So uh, you shouldn't go that route unless you necessarily have to. So then I also look at the velocity of that species. So, it's, so everything is now labeled A. I just uh, look at the A and then uh, the entire, if I have A and B, then the velocity of the entire phase, uh, phase is actually mass fraction of A times VA plus mass fraction of B uh, times uh, VB. And mass fraction is a number between zero and one that is uh, related to the fraction of A compared to the mass concentration of the entire, uh, of the entire phase all of the fractions always have to add up to one and that's something that we use when solving the problem uh, all of the mass concentrations add up to the mass concentration of the entire phase and then i have flip 
side of this problem, I can also look at the molar concentrations and everything pretty much remains the same. It just adds to the notation. So my CA is number of moles per volume. XA is now molar fraction. Uh, that is relative to the number of moles of everything, which is C. Uh, and I can also have related velocities. I also look at the, if I have production terms in the volume, they're labeled R, either lowercase or uppercase, depending whether we refer to mass or molar part. And we also have two versions of Fick's law, one for mass concentrations or mass fractions rather, and the other one for molar fractions. So my Fick's law, again, in a familiar way, flux is proportional to a gradient, and there's a simple coefficient of proportionality. Now we're looking at the gradients of mass fraction. Because of using fraction, I have to have a row here. And then my pro, uh, coefficient of proportionality is DAB. That is diffusivity of A in the presence uh, of B in the mixture of A and B. And I have, uh, I'm labeling this vector that, uh, that denotes the mass flux as JA. Yeah? And just like before, we have flux that is there just because of the gradient, nothing else. So in this case, we have gradient of mass fraction. That's my JA, that's my fixed law. And then I have stuff that moves into the volume uh, because I have motion of fluids in general. And that combined flux has a fixed law part and convective part and we're uh, labeling it as N in general and alpha. So I can look at an A and B and so forth, whoops. And then my molar equivalents for the, both of those things are uppercase J and uppercase N. And I go back and forth between rows and C's by using molar mass of component A. So row A is CA times molar mass. Okay. So in terms of shell balances, they kind of look the same, and I'm just going to really review them uh, over an example. And this is an important example, so I'm going to walk through it again because we're going to build on it uh, in our next example. So standard shell balance. I get myself, this is a diffusion through a stagnant film. I have liquid A here at the interface. I have a balance between the liquid A and its vapor. And this vapor starts diffusing upwards specifically because I have a gas stream that maintains a constant concentration of A. So because of the differences in concentrations or mass fractions, uh, or this is now molar. So difference in molar, both concentration and fraction, is going to cause motion. So to equilibrate. So now if I look at the little shell, this is a simple one dimensional problem because everything is sort of sealed in all the other directions. And I basically balance whatever comes into this little shell from this side at uh, boundary Z and whatever comes out at Z plus delta Z. Now I'm referring to the area as S because A is already taken and I'm labeling chemical sh species as A. Okay. So when I do that balance, I get a very simple equation, just like we've been getting for a while now. These equations in terms of combined fluxes look relatively simple. So DNA Z dz is equal to zero. Now the biggest problem here is what is Na? I have boundary conditions that are in terms of Xa, so I ultimately need an equation for Xa. And A by definition is my equivalent, fixed law equivalent for molar uh, components. So that's molar flux JA is for fixed law. And that's equal to minus C DAB gradient in XA and plus the convective component. Now convective co co component is essentially XA times the total molar flux, which is both NA and NB. That's great, but I don't want NB in this problem. Problem is relatively simple. 
for a stagnant film of B, we can approximate uh, that NB is approximately zero. So I just basically kill the term and then solve the equation. I get that allows me to express NA in terms of XA, then I can put it in the equation uh, that I just derived this the differential equation for NAZ or the Z component of it. This essentially means that NAZ is constant. And when I solve that, I get my solution. I get my solution in terms of XA. I'm not gonna go over the solution itself other than here it is. And I have I had boundary conditions that uh, enabled me to solve it. Now, if I actually am asking question, what is the flux? If I'm interested in the flux, maybe rate of evaporation and so forth, then I need to, that's another quirk, is if I actually want to evaluate NAZ for this problem, like NAZ is the importance because it's the flux, so I'm wondering how much of it is going away, then I have to basically differentiate that solution that I got again so that I can plug it in here and evaluate what NAZ is. So don't forget that, that once you have XA, you can go back, differentiate, and recover what this term is. Excellent. And we, last time, we looked at the practical problem. One trick is when I have evaporation from a uh, surface of a fluid, then the concentration at that surface is given by thermodynamics, and it's basically vapor pressure divided by overall pressure. So that's trick of sorts and something to remember that um, that's true at this interface. So that typically gives me concentration that is uh, on one uh, boundary. And then the other boundary, in this case, we assume that wind is whisking everything away. So basically I'm zero at some distance away from the interface. So this was a operation from a lake, say in Austin at 36 degrees. We are not at 36 degrees Celsius yet, but we are hitting 32 Celsius degrees pretty much daily. So we're gonna get there soon enough. Um, second thing is when I need number of moles, I will need some uh, equation of state to evaluate them often based on the pressure and temperature that are given for the problem. And in this case, it's okay to assume that air is ideal gas, so that saves the day. Excellent. Now we're moving on to add some reaction terms. So last time we essentially reviewed what can we have, and today we're gonna solve the problem. And I basically listed how boundary conditions can look like depending on the reactions present in the problem. So here the stagnant film didn't have any reaction at all. Um, it just had a stagnant film so that essentially uh, there was no source term uh, whatsoever, nor did that reaction tell us uh, anything about um, how to recover NB. And that's often the case with reactions. So today we will see some of those examples. First things first, if I have a problem where I know how much volumetrically of A is either produced or consumed, then you wanna use that. That's gonna be the simplest thing in terms of solving the equation. And then you have just this term RA that tells you, okay, this many kilograms of A is produced per meter cube per second. Or if you're talking about moles, then we have uppercase RA and you have a production or consumption term in terms of, um, in terms of a molar quantity. That's great if you have it. Often, and in a lot of practical situations, it's the surfaces and large surface areas that are causing, uh, that's where the reactions really happen. And they have to then be specified in terms of boundary conditions, especially if that's the surface that is bounding my volume. Okay. So in that case, I'm specifying flux of a at surface. I'm generally referring to surface as gamma here. This is uppercase Greek letter gamma. And then I typically have some, uh, uh, some coefficient. In this case, I'm referring to it as Kn double prime and CAN, where basically 
n is reaction order. So for order one, I'm going to have k1 c a to the power of one. So that's the simplest. Um, well, no, the simplest is n is equal to zero, in which case this is just the one. Uh, so and the the n a z is constant. So basically. I, I specify different types of order of reactions. Uh, some reactions are so fast that I'm going to have here n is equal to 2 and so forth. So in that case, I might be specifying rate of this chemical reaction on the surface. So for instance, it might look something like this. K1 CA0 is the first order heterogeneous reaction. I might be specifying flux at the surface even if I don't have the reaction. So sometimes I have a porous surface and stuff is coming in at a certain rate. Um, so I, if I know how to evaluate that rate, I can sm simply specify the flux. This is a common boundary condition in these problems where you have a certain flux specified. And I could also, if I know the concentration or measure the concentration, then I can have Xa or omega a specified at a location or surface. Now, one thing that is equivalent to problems with heat, if I have two surfaces whose diffusivities are orders of magnitude different, then I cannot assume that I have continuity of concentrations at that boundary simply because it doesn't have time to equilibrate. In that case, my flux support basically that boundary supports a difference in concentrations right near the boundary if i have solid uh, concentration ca0 right next to the boundary and bulk fluid concentration right next to the boundary cab they could be different and the flux is through that boundary so now boundary has a mass transfer coefficient um, and basically Na0 is that mass transfer coefficient times the difference in the, the concentrations. And this is very similar to Newton's law of cooling. It just doesn't have a specific name. All right. So those are our boundary conditions. Now let's move on to a problem. If I can find my notes. All right, my notes are right here. This is example 18.3 uh, in textbook. So this is BSL, example 18.3, or chapter rather. These examples in BSL are entire chapters because they take a moment to solve. And what we have here, it's going to be diffusion with the heterogeneous chemical reaction. Heterogeneous means that it's happening at surfaces. And what's really cool here is that these are complex surfaces. Now let's say that I have a reactor, chemical reactor, and I have spheres inside of that reactor. That's actually, red is appropriate if they're reactive. So I have spheres within, and those spheres increase surface area. And I have gas or a stream of gas that comes in. And what comes out is, is both A and B because B gets produced on the surface of these spheres. So spheres have catalytic material on their surface and on that surface we have a reaction where two moles of a hmm. okay produce one mole of b okay so basically i have things arrive at the surface A, if I zoom in, if 
Okay, come on. So this is my surface of A, and I'm drawing red as the reactive surface. So I have two moles of A arrive and one mole of B leaves the surface. So this is zoom in, let's say right here. Okay. Zoom in. Zoom in and zoom softer. And when I zoom in, then I also ignore the curvature of this surface. So I'm going to, I don't know. So this is the reaction that is given on the surface. I'd love to know what is the volumetric term here and what is the volumetric pr production of A, but I don't. Okay. So here, we do not know. what is the volumetric production of B or consumption of A of B consumption of A. And because of that, I cannot treat this in the shell balance as a volumetric term. So we are actually going to now zoom in and we're going to solve the problem in this zoomed version of the problem. So we are going to solve, going to solve the problem near surface only. So basically just in this zoomed version. So I'm going to, to assume Thinking about that diffusion in stagnant film, I'm just going to adjust it here for this uh, production and consumption term. So I'm going to assume a film around the surface. Okay. So we're going to assume a hypothetical film around the surface. And that film has, just like I drew in this uh, little problem, I'm going to label this as thickness delta. So I'm going to say delta is assumed thickness of a film around a sphere. And this is where I'm solving the problem. Okay. So on the outside of this film, I have this stream gas stream. So this is gas stream. So on the outside of the film, there's the stream that is whisking everything away. Outside of the film. Gas stream is taking away efficiently, which is not always a given. Better not pack those spheres too tightly. Gas stream is taking all products, or rather both A and B, efficiently uh, away, rather efficiently. So I know uh, what my, uh, basically what my, uh, so on that film boundary, I know what my concentrations are. So I know or pretend to know what concentrations of A, B are. Okay. And I'm going to put this as Z is equal to zero and Z is equal to delta. So at Z is equal to zero, which is on the outside of that film, I have XA is given. And it's XA zero. 
second assumption I'm going to make is that the moment A touches the surface here, when it shows up right here, then it disappears and instantaneously gets converted to B. So that reaction is pretty fast. And on the time scale of us looking at things, it appears that it's just pretty much happening immediately. So assume at Z is equal to delta, my concentration of A because of that instantaneous reaction is zero. So instantly upon touching the surface, A is consumed. Nothing's ever instant, but again, on the time scale of us looking at things, that's a good assumption. All right, so now I can also see that within this coordinate system, so this is my z direction, right? Because of that instant, so A touches the surface and immediately leaves as B in the opposite direction then what is true for fluxes of A and B? So because of the reaction, in this film, how do N molar flux and NAZ relate? Anyone? Any guesses? For for every two moles of A, I get one mole of B. And B equals negative and uh, two and A. Uh, one half, right? Oh, one half. Yeah, good job. Yes. So, and why do you have negative? It's correct. Why do you have it? Because one's consumed while the other one's produced. Well, one of them arrives at the surface, yes. One of them arrives at the surface, the other one leaves. Look at the coordinate system, right? So B is leaving, <laughs> A is arriving. So they have the opposite directions. Okay? But that's essentially one of them is produced and one of them is consumed. But like if I look at this, my little coordinate system, B is leaving in the opposite direction. So basically one mole of B for every two, two moles of A. Cool. So I actually have the relationship between N A and N B. Now, if I actually do a balance, just like we. So let me just remind you, just like we did in this problem. Okay. If I do a balance, this is a one day problem. I'm not assuming anything in cross happening in these cross directions to Z. So in X and Y, um, I don't have um, anything interesting happening. Everything is repeated in those directions. So I'm going to get the same. My balance will result in the same relationship or same equation for NA. And yes, I have a reaction, but that reaction is happening on the surface. So I cannot add a volumetric production or a source or sink term to this equation. So that's always important to distinguish. Yes, you might have a reaction, but the question is how are you accounting for it? And in this case, it's happening on the surface. Therefore, it's more entering through boundary conditions and these relationships of fluxes 
rather than anything else. Now, the second part is that I have an A, okay? And my general expression is that for an A, flux of an A is the fixed slope part plus the convective part, okay? So in general, so if we did this, so this is 1D problem. Note that production term term is not volumetric. And because of that, just like in, I'm going to refer to it as 18.2 chapter, D in a z b z is equal to zero from shell balance now what is n a in general n a is j a plus convection so basically flex law i'm just gonna write it Since I just showed you, I'm not going to rewrite it. Okay. So it's minus C D A B gradient of X A plus X A times N A plus N B. And I'm looking only for the Z direction in this problem. So my N A Z or Z component is minus C D A B D X A D Z plus X A N A Z plus N B Z. And this is where I use my knowledge of what N B Z is. Okay, so this term when I put that NBZ is minus one half NAZ, so this term is basically one half NAZ. Is everybody following? So essentially, I have everything so far similar as in the stagnant film, it's just how I apply boundary conditions in this particular case. I have the same equation, how do we now express an A? And it's the surface reaction that changes that. If you remember, in the previous problem, we had NB is zero, okay? Here, NB is not zero, it's minus half NA, and that gives me one half NAZ here. So I have NAZ on both sides, I have to uh, resolve it. Whoa, what happened here? All right. So I have to resolve that, so. I'm going to put it all on one side. So I'm going to get that NAZ times 1 minus 1 half XA is minus C DAB DXA DZ. So NAZ is minus 1 over 1 half XA DXA dz another way to write it is minus uh, 2 over 2 minus xa whoa uh, um dxa dz okay now from shell balance we know that the derivative of an az uh, with respect to z direction is zero so this term has to be equal to some constant, right? So basically I have is that since D N A Z D Z is zero, that gives me that minus two over two minus X A D X A D Z is equal to constant. I'm going to call it C1 since C is normally reserved for molar concentration. 
Um, and whether I have two or one, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna make this a one here. Again, whether it's a constant. So if I divide it by two, it's still a constant. I'm not gonna rename it now. And this is fortunate. Can I integrate this immediately? Anyone? When was your differential equation? When was the last time you saw this differential equation? Or is it the Monday morning, huh? Isn't it just Ellen? And the, when I integrate the other side is C1Z plus C2, some other constant too. And this is where I plug in my boundary conditions. Wouldn't the negative go away? Uh, yes, it would. Technically, still remains the same, but yes, it would. as long as I correctly put boundary conditions, C1 and C2 can absorb that negative. So it's one of those mistakes that you make, but you can survive. <laughs> All right. So this is my, uh, in my boundary conditions at Z is equal to zero. I have X is equal to X A zero. And at Z is equal to Delta. I have x is equal to zero. So I plug, plug those in. How about I'll give you a couple of minutes to find C1 and C2. Just to wake you up this morning. Did anybody recover C1, C2?
You're still working on it? Got C2 equal to ln 2 minus x a naught and then C1 equal to ln 2 divided by 2 minus x a naught and then that's all divided by delta. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. So I'm going to just write the final solution. So basically find C1, C2. And I'm going to present it in terms of the way the book does back to this uh, 1 minus 1 half xa instead of 2 minus xa. It's really a matter of uh, preference. So you can clean this up and get the final solution as 1 minus 1 half xa is equal to 1 minus 1 half xa naught. So that's some number. Mm -hmm. and to the power of 1 minus z divided by delta. So z by delta divided by delta, it's a normalized z coordinate that goes from z. Uh, it's from 0 to 1. Okay. And just like before, if I was actually interested in figuring out what the actual flux is, then I would go to NAZ and see that there is a derivative. So basically, if you take a derivative of this solution as written here, then this term dxa dz divided by 1 minus 1 half xa, dxa dz will show up from taking a derivative of this expression as given right here. And you will be able to find what NAZ is. I'm just going to write down the um, Final solution. So, oh, I don't know what's going on. First, I have a little bit of a lag between writing and thing, and then I think that's causing a little bit of a trouble. So, NAZ is minus one half XA DXA DZ, which I can get. And I'm just going to borrow the from the book, which says that it's 2CDAB divided by delta ln 1 minus 1 half xa0. So now if I was, and if I wanted to get B, well, B and BZ is just minus one half NAZ, right? So that's the local flux. This is local flux near sphere surface, these catalytic surfaces. Technically, if I wanted to get a volumetric term, and as I assume that all of these spheres are, uh, that all of these assumptions really apply to them. And there is this film delta and I can, um, so there is a sort of a film around every sphere. They're not too tightly packed. So I can, uh, my gas stream can uh, really take away uh, A and B and maintain this constant a concentration xa0 that is sort of further away from the sphere surfaces. So if I have a way to uh, find that, then this is near every surface. So if I have an idea of what is the surface area per volume, I could recover a volumetric term for production or consumption of B from that. Now, at the same time, since I don't always know precisely xa0, that remains as a sort of a fitting parameter that I can use by actual volumetric measurements and see whether things fit. So what I'm going to put here as a comment is that with 
an estimate. There we go again. Of surface area, total surface area per volume. This can serve to, it's called upscaling basically because I would go with one scale up uh, without seeing the spheres. Uh, so uh, one scale above all of these spheres to get volumetric consumption term RA. And if I get that, then I can solve this equation differently and sort of on a larger scale without seeing all of the details of all of the spheres. Are there any questions about this? So again, we were solving this near every surface, ignoring curvature of the surface, assuming that there is a film around every surface where we can have these assumptions. Okay. And that changed our overall solution slightly. So this is a slightly different from the solution for the, um, for the uh, film, for the stagnant film. Now, there is another variation, and I'm just going to call it a variation, and I'm just going to comment on it because it actually turns out a little difficult to solve. So that's going to be our final comment for today. Variation that is variation two. So assume that our A does not completely disappear on the surface. So assume a slightly different reaction. But basically, is some coefficient k1 ca so it basically my naz is um consumed at the surface at a rate that is proportional to xa so a is consumed at the surface at a rate proportional to XA or CA for that matter. Then my boundary conditions of the problem. So now I'm not producing B. My boundary conditions, they change to the following. At Z is equal to zero. I still assume that my XA is XA zero maintained by the stream of gas through the reactor and at z is equal to delta i have that naz is k1 double prime cxa so at this boundary xa is naz divided by k1 double prime c So now suddenly you have slightly different, so you would still have, we still have the same equation. D and Z, DZ, uh, NA, uh, NAZ. Okay. is equal to zero and that resulted in minus ln or plus rather two minus x a is equal to some constant c1 c1 z plus c2 so at one of these boundaries it's simple to impose so at z equal to zero I get what my C2 is, right? 
but for the other one, so it's z equal to zero. When I apply it, I get that C2 is ln 2 minus 6 a zero. But at z is equal to delta, I get that ln of 2 minus naz k1c is equal to c1 delta plus c2. And naz is essentially the it's constant, right? Because its derivative is zero. So I could call this naz zero if I wanted to. So to solve this, you have to solve this nonlinear equation. And this is root finding. Okay. So this is gets a little more difficult to solve and it can be done um, but it has to be done uh, numerically okay, root finding so as usual in these problems a little bit of a variation in boundary conditions can give me some uh, issues in finding analytical solutions. Okay, but again, it's still conceptually the same. We apply boundary conditions and with given boundary conditions, we should be able to solve somehow. Okay, questions? 